Welcome, welcome everybody. Greg Peterson coming to you from the Urban Farm in the heart of Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm here tonight with Janice. Hello there, Greg. How we doing? Uh, it's been an interesting and awesome week. That, <laughs> that it has. That it has. <laughs> and today we've been dealing with some technology glitches. Oh boy, that's always fun. You know, I was in technology. Um, well, I was actually my first business here in town in the 1970s and 80s. I used to clean surface and build fish ponds. And then in 84, between 84 and 2004, I was actually in technology doing computer programming. And I owned the Apple Authorized Training Center here in town. And in that 20 years, I got so much technology. I got more technology than I ever need. So that's why I ran back to the farm, you know? Yeah. 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 So, Okay, because it just frustrates me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, it just frustrates day. me. All right, so what are we doing tonight, Miss Janice? Oh, some crazy person decided we needed to bring more mesquite activity to our valley and oh went out and got this machine, and now we've got mesquite fever. <laughs> mesquite fever. I'm going to bring Peggy on. Let's say hi to Peggy. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Greg. Hi, Janice. Hey, Peggy. You're sounding Can great. Can you hear me? Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. So, um, you want to do an intro for Peggy? Oh, sure. I've been working on putting all my notes together. Hey, everybody. I want to introduce my friend, Peggy Sue Sorensen. Peggy Sue has been uh, living here in the Valley for a while, and she is our one of our resident foraging experts and she's been teaching a few classes for us including for those of you who have gone through some of them our weed class the oh, yeah. edible weeds mm -hmm. so and she did our fire cider class so we are welcoming back Peggy Sue Sorensen on another topic that she feels very strongly and passionate about because she does like mesquite pods, and she's got a wonderful class on how to do so much with them. I remember the first class I took with her. It was about mesquite, and I was mesmerized. And I got stuff to taste at the end. Nice. So that's Peggy Sue Sorensen. Cool. So let's go, Peggy Sue. Let's get jump in. Oh, thank you. Hi. I'm happy to be here. Well, yeah. you know what? We're going to have information at the end about local classes, so go good for it. Good. Piggy. Okay. Well, I just want to say that it is much more fun to be able to be in person, like the class that you attended, Janice, to be able to pass around the pods and just even uh, – limbs and you know the tree limbs so that people can see what the tree looks like and take them outside and harvest some pods have all this hands-on stuff taste the flower taste things that are made with mesquite so i feel like my hands are tied and you're not getting all of the uh you know hands-on that i would love for you to have but there there will be some activities, some uh, harvesting later that um, I believe Janice will talk about at the end. Or you can go to uh, Grow PHX events calendar and find out. But for now, um, I just want to just help you learn how to identify a mesquite tree, uh, the proper way to harvest, dry, store, and grind the pods in the flour, and really, more, most importantly, how to eat it. And so I'll give you some tips on that. And um, I believe that more than ever, we need to not only grow our food, but we need to discover the plants that grow all around us that provide food and medicine. There's far more than what we realize, and I have found that when I uh, walk around and uh, show people what's in their yard, they, they're just really surprised, even the weeds. You know, there's cactus, trees, weeds, all kinds of plants that grow in, in the desert and across the country. 
wherever you are. So uh, mesquite is one of the uh, three bean trees that are producing right now. And we're, you know, for this to be a desert, uh, we have a bounty of food that is red, just about ready to harvest. And so, you know, uh, indigenous peoples uh, lived off of this, this type of food. And who knows, with the way things are going, uh, that we may be dependent on it as well. So I think it's really important to learn what we have growing in our area wherever you live and start now in, uh, you know, you can't just learn how to uh, do something. You need hands-on practice so that when you need it, you are, uh, you're ready. You know how to use it. You know the safety. Uh, you know, just there's so much to learn. So that's what you'll learn tonight about mesquite. So, uh, you know, I grew up in a typical American home, and we ate from the grocery store. There was plenty of food on the table. So, you know, I, when I saw commercials like this where Yule Given said, uh, you can eat a pine tree or you can eat cattails, I thought, okay, you know, I never thought about going out, even though it was within walking distance. I had pine trees in my yard and cattails across the street, but I never thought of eating either one of them, and mainly because I never saw anyone else eat it, and it was just foreign. It was very foreign, and in the same way, a lot of people have mesquite trees or Palo Verde or ironwood trees in their yard or close by, and they don't, need, they don't know that it's good for food. And even if they do, they're like, how do you eat it? I mean, especially a mesquite pod. It's not your typical bean pod, but they, they're just, it's just like trash. People just don't realize it falls to the ground and they, they just discard it. But uh, so just a little bit more about myself. I did start foraging uh, back in about 1981-82 when I moved to Michigan and I had a piece of property that had wild asparagus and wild raspberries. So that kind of got me started. But those were things that were recognizable in the store. So when I saw them out, uh, walking down a path or you know down a creek, I I was able to recognize them. But when I came to the desert, I did not see food, and you know it was it, was, it had a beauty of its own. But I couldn't imagine why anyone would settle here. I just thought that was uh, very. I just couldn't, I couldn't put two and two together, like what did they live on? I, I was sure they grew some crops, you know, the corn, and beans and squash and that type of thing. But um, I thought about this thing for a long time, and so that's uh, something that I really desired to learn. And the answer came to me when I went to the Wild Foods Brunch given by Linda Runyon back in 1990. And she, if you've never heard of her, she, she was a wild foods um, person. Uh, she lived off the land, and she taught other people. She gave uh, plant walks, and she gave this wild foods brunch where there, were, there was a number of plants, uh, trees, weeds, cactus, and the only thing that I remember eating was the tumbleweed pancakes with prickly pear syrup. But it, it was all good. I mean, it was all amazing food. And it, uh, it really was like a light bulb went off. Like, okay, there's food out there that we don't know. And so I went on a mission to learn it. Unfortunately, I... You know, I had little kids, and I didn't go to her, any of her her plant walks. 
So I had to kind of learn on my own, but it's been a mission of mine to learn these things. So my next time, my next big light bulb was uh, I started going to classes. It was uh, through the Phoenix Permaculture Guild, if any of you knew, uh, knew that back in the day, back about 12 years ago when Greg and Don uh, formed uh, Phoenix Permaculture Guild. And so I took classes there every single week. And one week we took a class in a park and we learned about mesquite. Now, I did not know what a mesquite tree was, but I knew, I mean, I, I kind of knew, but I, I still couldn't identify it. I couldn't go out and identify it. So. Um, so this was a thrill to to go out and just um, see see some trees up close and harvest and uh, do go through the whole process and take it to the hammer mill uh, that year. So why why all the excitement about mesquite? Yes, it's free food, and you know your pets can eat it too. A lot of them like you know, dogs and turtles like mesquite, and it, it does taste good. It ta has a sweet taste, and uh, it's very nutritious. And, you know, there, there are ways of using it in recipes, and um, especially if you're cutting down on sugar, it's a real good uh, substitute. And it just grows all around us. So if you eat mesquite, if you pick the pods off of your tree, if you have one in your yard, you're going to eliminate the waste that falls on the ground and all the trash that gets thrown into the landfill. And it truly was a survival food, so it was considered a staple. So uh, you can see really how nutritious it is. And the things that stand out in the seed, the seed when you have it milled in the hammer mill, it crushes the seed and it makes available the, the protein, which is two times the amount of protein as any other bean. And it has varying amounts of sucrose. Some are sweeter than others. And the other thing that really stands out is the amount of potassium that it has. It, potassium is actually hard to get in your diet. So this really excited me when I saw that I think it's something like one-fourth one the amount of your daily needs. So, it, and it's fairly uh, low glycemic. Now, there are different varieties of mesquite in Arizona, three native mesquites, and then we have some thornless mesquite trees that are brought in from, um, you know, basically South America. And those are the ones that you find in most nurseries. Unfortunately, uh, those, those pods don't taste good at all. In fact, uh, uh, one uh, Native American, uh, I don't remember who it is, uh, they don't even let their, their cows eat the non-Native pods because it upsets their stomach. And uh, so I don't eat it. Even if I can taste one that's not too bad, I I, I take my um, caution to that and just stick with the, the native varieties. And, you know, if we cut down on the non-natives, then we're going to have less cross-pollination and, you know, developing hybrids. So we want to keep our true native mesquite trees and let them cross-pollinate between themselves. So we'll look at those a little bit closer in, in a couple slides. Uh, first, I just want to uh, help you to get a general feel for the mesquite. And like if you're driving or walking or riding a bike, 
I want you to, to be able to learn how to identify a mesquite tree. And as you can see, the Palo Verde is full of pods. And the mesquite tree, you can't see the pods too well. But look at the, the darker trunk and the, the darker leaves. Usually against another tree, it kind of stands out. And here's another picture. It's a common size for landscapes. Of course, they get much larger. And you can see the, the leaves, the very tiny leaves. If you look up close, you can see the, the thorns. They're straight thorns, and they form a V shape off of the limb or off of the stem, either one. And um, let's see. Let me see. Okay. So let me go back just a minute. Um, so what I want you to, to recognize is the straightness of the thorns. And there, there is a cat claw acacia that has a similar look to the mesquite tree, but they have curved thorns. And I don't have that picture, but uh, you don't want to get too close to them. Uh, if you do, you have to have a lot of body armor because with cat claw, you can just picture getting caught by it very, very easily. It's much more dangerous than a mesquite tree. And um, I've never eaten the pods, but I, I, I know that they are edible, but the mesquite tree is much better. So the flowers on a mesquite are called catkins. and you may have seen them, but they're not very showy. They're not showy like a Palo Verde, you know, the yellow flowers or the um, kind of the purplish pink flowers on um, ironwood trees. But they they form, and then they you can see the on the right hand side the the green pods, and they turn into the ripe pods. The light colored pods. And that's what they're doing right now. They're in that phase right now. You, you may probably see some flowers, but most of them are green and they're turning ripe right now. So just to give you another idea of the type of pod. Now, most people think of beans and peas. You shell them. You open up the shell and you take the bean or the pea out and you eat it, you cook it up and eat it. Well, that's the way the Palo Verde and Ironwood are. So if you're looking at those and they open up, you know that those are not mesquite pods. The mesquite pod, you can see uh, it does not split open and you can break it apart and now, these pods are very pulpy. Not all, all of them are, but I took a picture of this one because you can see that um, the, seed pod, the seed is enclosed in the pod and um, the pulp is around the seed pod. And you eat the, basically you're eating the pulp when you chew on a pod and then... Um, you know, the well, we'll talk about milling, but when it's the only way to really get to the, the bean and to crush it and make it available is through uh, a hammer mill. So the other variety, the other uh, one is screw bean, and you can see the different phases, the flowers, the unripe pods, and the ripe pods. And... Uh, they it, it's quite interesting. I really haven't worked with it very well, but or very much. Um, I collected a few one time, and but they are they are good. They are very sweet. And uh, since I haven't worked with it, I was told that it is coarser flower and it doesn't hold together as well. So right now is harvest season. It's the beginning of the harvest season, and 
uh, I start looking at June 1st. I start looking for ripe pods. And this year and last year, I did not see ripe pods, whereas uh, three years ago on June 1st, I did see ripe, some ripe pods. So uh, it's the season lasts. Well, the tree produces all summer pretty much, especially when we have rains, but we only want to harvest in June before the monsoon uh, begins when, it's, when it gets very humid and then it starts to rain. That, that's when we have to be very cautious and um, you know, not harvest. Now, we did have rain last Friday night. And, or at least some of us did. Uh, we had a little bit of rain. The one thing that I want to um, assure you, if they rain, if it rains on unripe pods, if, if they're green and they get wet, then they will not develop aflatoxin. But once they become completely ripe, or pretty close to being ripe. And if they get wet, then they will start to develop aflatoxin. And uh, it's just the beginning of it developing. It's not like it's zapped and it's full of aflatoxin. So uh, basically the point is don't harvest during the monsoon if there is a harvest if there are some pods um, in the fall, once it gets starts to get dry again, then you can harvest again. So uh, basically, don't wash off your pods. They don't need to be rinsed off, washed off, anything like that, and don't let them get wet. If it's going to rain, if you know it's going, or it might rain, then harvest the right pods before before it rains. So all this talk about aflatoxin, I know it's like this word and this, uh, what is, you know, do I even want to uh, deal with this? Because, you know, we didn't know about it back when I first learned, uh, when I first started learning or harvesting uh, mesquite pods. But, you know, I, I'm convinced that if you if you do what your what uh, the best practices of harvesting before the monsoon and only harvesting from the tree, not from the ground, you um, the U USDA has uh, a standard. I think it's twenty something another. I had it written down somewhere. Um, an amount that uh, any food, because it is found on lots of food. And I'm, the more I study about aflatoxin, the more I'm like, oh, it's on everything, and just about. I mean, and, I mean, it's something we have to think about even if we're growing other things in our garden. So we might as well learn about it use best practices, and, but I, if you have any health issues, especially kidney or liver issues, just avoid it. Or, or if uh, you're expectant, babies, possibly young children, um, you, the, the way that this works is, is, is a, a cumulative, and if you eat it every day, then it's going to accumulate quicker. And so if you're just eating it once in a while um, or you're just eating smaller amounts, then it's not going to affect you uh, in a bad way. But, uh, yeah, if you have liver issues, just especially don't uh, because... Hey, Peggy? Excuse me? Yeah. Let me jump in here. Can you tell everybody what an af what is aflatoxin? Oh yes, it's a it's a 
byproduct of a fungus or a mold. Wow, very good. And it's often found in peanuts as well, right? Exactly. It's found in uh, found on corn, wheat, rice, soybeans, peanuts, sunflower seeds, chilies, nuts, and so much more. Got Some it. spices, just a lot of just a lot of food. Mm -hmm. And so yes. Um, and, and one thing. Re really, the takeaway mm -hmm. here is that we need to pick the beans off of the trees when they're dry, when it's not right. monsooning. Exactly. Okay, good. We don't cool. want, yes, we don't want uh, high humidity or rain. And see, the, it's the combination of high humidity, rain, and high, high temperatures. High heat, right. So those, those things uh, cause aflatoxin to increase. And it's something, it's a, it's a, there's a mold or a fungus in the soil, and it, it does come up into the air, so it will, uh, you know, like the winds here especially uh, kick up, then it can be blown into the trees. But so, the, big, the big thing is, is that don't harvest the beans off of the ground, because once they hit the ground, they likely have aflatoxin in them, right? Absolutely, Excellent. especially, 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 never pick them up off the ground if you're going to take them to the hammer mill, because then it will cross, it will contaminate the hammer mill and contaminate everyone else's mesquite pods. So well, last last year we had actually somebody bring some beans in that had some aflatoxin on it. It looks black on the beans, right? Well, aflatoxin is an invisible mold, or it's, uh -huh. an in, it's invisible. Uh -huh. So th there can be mold that forms on a pod, but I'm not sure what type of mold that is. Got it. Cool. I could, All right. I could look that up. Nice. So if you, if you want to have your, uh, there's, there's a method of, preparing your flour for testing. If you want to uh, contact uh, U of A, you can go through desertharvesters.org and find out the specifics of uh, getting your flour tested. Now, I know someone in the Valley who tested a lot of flour last year and did not find any or at least it was a, it was below the safe standards. So now, as far as if you, what I've done, what I've started doing uh, the past couple of years is, if I do pick off the ground, I pick like within that day, but I never take it. I never I keep it in a separate batch. I never put it in with the batch that will go to the I'm gonna, mill. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to stop you here because that's an absolute no-no in the milling arena. Um do in not, the milling. In the mill. Exactly. Right? Or the mill. Um Yeah, for that, the mill. That, that's a, Yeah, that's the point that I'm making. Um if you want to use it for your own like make to make mesquite um a, to boil it and make mm -hmm. a mesquite drink. That's the way I use it because high heat can kill it. But um, that's the only way I would do it. Use those pods is to to boil the pods and kill it, kill the aflatoxin. So I just thought I'd throw that in. Uh, but an, an additional um, piece of information that I've learned is that chlorophyll does limit the absorption of aflatoxin. So I would encourage you to either eat a big salad, a good uh, bowl of spinach and kale and or whatever greens you can eat, or just take some... Um, uh, well, chlor well, you can take chlorophyll tablets. So, 
safety, that is, that is the key, though, uh, above all else. There's plenty of pods, so we don't have to, to pick. And I honestly, I want to point this out. Uh, there are a lot of people who buy mesquite flour from from people, and they don't know where it's been where it's been uh, if it's been from picked from the ground or not. And there's one person who advertises on YouTube that he makes up his pods and grinds them up and sells them. So uh, be you know that's a, a safety thing where you can. You can know where your pods come from if you pick them off the tree and you have them milled here locally. So you want to uh, find the tree, a mesquite tree, and before you harvest a bunch of pods, you want to taste one or two pods from that tree. Each and every tree, I don't care if you have 10 trees in one yard, uh, you want to taste each tree and make sure it tastes good and, because every tree is different. And you may have a, a good tasting tree and one that's not so good tasting growing right next to each other. So you break the, the pod and you put a piece of the pod in your mouth and you just let it sit in your mouth for, for a few minutes or for a few seconds or whatever and it moistens up and then you can lightly chew on it and what you're doing is you're chewing the pulp and you're not biting down on the seed because the seed is very hard. That's why the hammer mill is needed to break that seed. And then um, once it once you chew the flavor out, then you discard that. And um, so if you, it should taste at least a mild sweetness. Some, some are much sweeter than others. If it has, it might taste, start to taste sweet, but after, afterwards, like maybe even, you know, 30 seconds later, it might you might start getting this kind of a funny feeling in your mouth where it's like oh it's kind of taking the moisture out of my mouth. Um, it might be a little chalky. It just doesn't taste right. Don't harvest from that tree because whatever you make, it's that's how your food is going to taste. It's going to have that funny mouth feel and you'll you'll just have to throw it away probably. <laughs> uh, but yes, if you have anything that has any kind of a burning sensation um, in your throat, then throw that away. Don't. Uh, and that's only happened to me one time and I, w I was picking from some, who knows, maybe that was in the early days, maybe it wasn't a true uh, mesquite, maybe it was something else. So uh, I just want to encourage you to, if you don't, if your first tree isn't good, just don't give up. Go find another tree. So like we've been saying, you want to either pull from the tree or use a stick. Either way, I encourage you to lay down a large tarp. Anchor it down with some rocks because the wind can blow that tarp and your, all of your pods on, on the ground uh, quite easily. So just uh, lay that tarp down and as you move it, make sure that the top of the tarp doesn't get flipped over and touch the ground. You want to keep that top portion as you know, of course, clean as possible. You don't want contact with the ground. Once again, just even even uh, dogs, especially little dogs, should meet from the ground. If you if your dog likes 
um, pods and take them from the tree. Keep them off the ground and uh, just feed them to them. You can even make like dog biscuits with them. So when once you have your pods, you want to sort them and remove the green pods. Some people I've heard have cooked the green pods. I've tried it. I haven't found a way to make them taste good yet. Uh, but yeah, just you don't want to have green pods in with the mature pods. And you um, obviously want to remove the leaves and the stems. Uh, so if you find pods with bird droppings, just just toss them. You do not want to wash them at all. And there are variations of color. There's some with red striations, and that's what this picture is. Um, a number of pods that I picked from one tree that up close, they were just beautiful pods. And uh, somebody might look at it and say, well, they're spotted or discolored, but there's a difference between like a black mold and just the variation of color in a pod. So, and these came from the tree. And they were new, pretty new, newly uh, uh, ripened too. So they hadn't been on the tree long enough to uh, form mold. I'm not so sure there would be mold on pods on trees, but who knows, maybe if, it rained and it's on the north side of a tree in the shade, um, then possibly. So, you know, just be on the lookout, especially if the pods have been hanging on for for a while. And uh, one, one thing that a lot of people wonder about are the holes. I mean, I've had a number of people say, I threw these pods away because they were full of holes. And... There, there are two things about the uh, about them. First of all, they're they're made from a brood beetle that lays their egg on the flower, and then they kind of drill or eat their way out of the pod. So it means that the pod, the beetle, isn't there anymore. But um, if if there was a, you know, not all pods have brood beetles in them, but uh, I would say a good portion of them do. So uh, the beetle has come out, and uh, the other thing, though, I mean, they are okay, but they are more uh, susceptible to uh, moisture, or uh, you know, if they get moist, then they might get some mold or uh, some aflatoxins. So. I would just be mindful of that if you if you if you do harvest them dry and keep them dry, then the holes should be okay. So this is a picture of the bean weevil. It's a brucid be beetle. And I may I, I enlarged this. It's a very, very, very tiny bug, and you can see it in the upper left hand corner of the baggie. And it's very, very harmless. I mean, I, I don't like bugs at all. But these don't, they've never bothered me. I mean, of course you don't want them flying around your house. So <laughs> um, if, you know, but they, they really don't last very long, even if they do. If you uh, happen to see some, they usually fly to the window and, they they don't live very long. So what I do, there's two ways that I caught I uh, il, at least uh, minimize the number of brood beetles that hatch in in the pods. And my favorite way now is to freeze the pods. So as soon as I can get them 
um, sorted, then I put them into containers, airtight containers, and I put them in the freezer. And I've, I usually, I tried 24 hours, but then it seemed like that wasn't quite long enough. So I would say at least two to three days to kill the larvae. And once you take them out of the freezer, you let them come to room temperature before you open them so it doesn't, so the pods don't reabsorb any moisture from uh, from the from the freezer, or even if you keep them in the in the refrigerator, you may put them in the refrigerator first. If you don't have room, it's like oh, you know, I've got to make room before I can put them in the freezer. At least get them in the refrigerator before you put them in the fr freezer. Put them in the refrigerator, and uh, that will keep them cool and uh, inhibit the the hatching of the larvae. So once you take them out of the, out of the freezer, you want to dry them again. Even if you do, you know, go through the steps that I just said by waiting until it comes to ambient temperature, uh, you still want to dry it again. So. You toast it in the oven. You can do it on low, and but you still want to keep it. Keep an eye on it. it um, you, you can walk away, but if you use high heat like I do, I use about 325. If you do that, you've got to stay on top of it. I go through a lot of. You know, I have to toast a lot of pods. So um, if if you do it, uh, move move the pods around so that they dry evenly and um, have a couple of trays going and move them from the top to the bottom. What, you're, what, what you want to make sure, you want to test them for dryness and using the snap test. So when you can snap a bean in half and it, you hear a clear, dry snap, or even a rattle, you hear the beans rattling in there, you know that they're pretty dry, but the snap test is the best way. So if you come home and you have to get dinner ready first or whatever, um, this is what I like to do is leave my pods in a shallow box or maybe lay sheets down on the seat and, uh, throughout the car and just lay all the pods out in a very um, shallow, uh, you know, box, and uh, it, your car is a is a solar big solar oven. So so take use of that. Keep your windows closed, and you know when it's in the sun, it can it can get pretty hot in there. And and do the same thing. Toss them around and uh, just. You're not killing brugid beetles doing that, but at least you're drying the pods. And as soon as possible, get those pods sorted out, get the green pods out away from them, because that will you know, produce moisture right there and, uh, and continue with the process that, that I was just talking about. Another way of toasting, the traditional way is uh, like this Siri woman, so you may want to uh, go to YouTube link or just type in Mesquite John Slattery and watch the video. I think it's very interesting. So here is the hammer mill, and this is what uh, all the fuss is about. And we have uh, a calendar on Grow PHX. Uh, dot events. Go to uh, one of these dates and uh, register for the milling. There's also um, on the 20th on that same calendar there's a harvest event, so you can sign up for that as well. And the cost is seven dollars and fifty cents for a pound. 
for each pound of milled flour that you receive back, which you receive back from your own pods, you will pay $7.50. And if you volunteer, if you want to get some free flour, then contact Janice at growphx.com. Can I jump in here real quick? So, you sure may. Cool. So the the m machine that you're looking at there on the right, that's a um, it's a little bit deceiving. Um, it sits on a trailer, on a 14-foot trailer, and when it's all set up like this, it's about 9, 10 feet tall. Um, and the way that the milling events work, they're public events, so we educate you on how to effectively pick and dry your beans. Then you bring the beans to the milling day, and uh, you have to make sure that they're free of sticks and free of mold and, uh, you know, all that's in that bucket is beans and then we check it, then we mill that uh, and we actually mill your your beans into your flour. So we'll keep it, you know, we'll keep it separated and it'll be interesting this year because we're going to have to do social distancing and, um, you know, there's there's more parameters, but that's how the program works and then you leave with uh, mesquite flour. Yay. And, and this so, is what... Hold on one more. Sorry, I have one more okay. thought. Um, you actually don't, as a, as a um, volunteer, you don't get free flour. You get free milling. So you can bring your beans in and get them milled. Because I, exactly. I don't know that anybody on our team is going to uh, go harvest beans. Because, you know, it's a bit of a process to uh, go harvest beans. So harvest your own beans and volunteer, and then you get them milled for free. Exactly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're doing great. You bring, <laughs> thank you. If you bring pods, some of the flour will be milled for free. So yes, bring. You have to pick your own pods, um, and 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 go through the same process. So uh, here is uh, last year's. Just uh, at the upper left. We're sorting the pods, so we're checking every single pod that comes in, and usually we can tell instantly if if they're good pods or not. Uh, but then we handle them and make sure they're dry, and uh, there's nothing, no foreign objects, and you know we can tell we could tell one person who brought in. Pods from the ground, we just knew. We could, I mean, I knew. <laughs> and so we keep... It's pretty, it's pretty easy to see it. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, for safety reasons, no one wants to do that anyway. So in the upper right, you can see a little bit of the, the hammer mill. Uh, they're feeding the pods into it, and it, it's a pretty huge... Uh, machine, so you can see how tall it is above their head, and they're leaning over to put the the pods in, and then they're putting the flour in, and and I was all excited with all the flour that I got from that day. So, if you should happen to only harvest a little bit, just a little bit of, or if you're waiting for the milling event and you just can't wait to grind a little bit in your house, you can do, you can use uh, a coffee grinder or ma magic bullet. I haven't tried the Vitamix. I've heard it's, it works, but you still have to use very small amounts, uh, usually a quarter of a cup at a time and may maybe a half a cup with a Vitamix. But um, you don't want to grind it for very long. Usually, n much more than 20 seconds at a time, it will get gummed up. And so it's it's a very slow process, uh, but you can sift it out and, or, yeah, sift it out for flour and use the chaff for broth. You can boil it up and use it for broth. We had, or at least some of us, uh, use this process 
when we didn't have a hammer mill, and I guarantee you, uh, after something like three years of not having a hammer mill and having to grind small batches like that, we're just so thankful and so thrilled that that Greg brought uh, a hammer mill to Phoenix. So, well, our, um, well, our whole our whole team brought it to Phoenix. It was just my yeah, crazy. Okay. It was just my crazy idea to get it done, but then. Uh, you know, everybody <laughs> stepped forward and put up money, and we did a fundraiser last year or so. Well, we we still thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so don't ever try to use a food processor. That just doesn't work at all. And in electric grain mill, you can use one, but it will gum up the insides, and it will ruin it and you'll probably throw it away. So just, I would not advise that at all. Storing flour, uh, you wanna keep it airtight to keep the, keep the flour from absorbing moisture. And even though you can leave it on the shelf uh, for a period of time, um, it is best to keep it in the refrigerator, but long long term, I would freeze it. So if it does absorb some moisture, uh, you may want to sift it. If it gets real lumpy, uh, like a big hard lump of flour, it's not bad. It can, you can still use it. You can just grate it. And you can uh, there there are various recipes out there. The Eat Mesquite is uh, a great book uh, cookbook you can go to desertharvesters.org and order that and uh, but just in general when you use mesquite flour if you want to incorporate it into your own recipe then if it has wheat flour you want to substitute just one fourth to one third cup of mesquite flour for wheat flour because mesquite flour is gluten free and there are recipes you can use let's say gluten free recipes you could probably just substitute uh, let's say if they call for coconut flour or almond flour just try the mesquite flour and see how it works you may need to reduce some of your sweetener to, um, because if your pods are sweet, uh, you don't want to make your food too sweet. Uh, you could just add the flour in whatever you're making, uh, soups or bread or, uh, not bread, um, just anything that you're making, uh, a drink. Uh, let's say you're making a protein drink. Add it to your protein drink. Just experiment. That's the key. That's what I did for a long time. Um, you know, I tried to incorporate it into whatever I was cooking that day. But here are a couple of recipes that I like to make. Um, I make these, you know, it's just a uh, truffle, mesquite balls, with one cup of flour, one cup of nut butter, and then you can add anything else that you want. And, I, I don't add all of these ingredients at once. I just, whatever I have on hand or whatever I feel like making at the time. Um, but I, I really like the cinnamon, salt, and mm -hmm. sometimes I add herbs. Like, especially if someone is not feeling well, uh, why not sneak some uh, some whatever herbs that you have at the time that you would want to add. Um, I, I added mallow one time, some mallow leaves, and, um, and even mint leaves. So you can roll them up into balls and roll that into flour or cocoa powder or coconut, or you can just put it in that nut butter jar that you took the nut butter out and use it like you would a nut butter and, and just spread it, make a sandwich or crack, put it on crackers or whatever. 
And this is the mesquite nectar that I really like to make. And I will I will put both of these on, um, I guess, a blog post or something so that uh, if you don't get to write these down. But basically, I, I boil the pods. And you can use any recipe you want, but this is the standard recipe that I've been using lately. And I boil it for 15 minutes. Then I put the top one, let it cool. I blend it up because it, it rips open the pods. And what I'm getting at is the pulp inside of it. And I use the thick, pulpy pods for this just to get the the most goodness out of it. And then once it cools, I strain it off and I set the liquid aside. Well, sometimes I've used the same liquid and sometimes I add fresh liquid. But either way, I'm, uh, I, I'm boiling it one more time and running it through the blender again and then uh, straining it. So you're getting all the goodness and squeezing it out completely. And you can drink it just like that, or you can boil it down into a simple syrup. So I hope you're, you get prepared, uh, have your tarp and stick and your baskets or boxes ready, and you know, take them in your vehicle. You never know where you might go that, you know, your nice, clean uh, area to harvest from, and uh, you don't want to be caught without the right tools. So this uh, is a mesquite book that I am in the process of writing. I was hoping it would be ready by tonight, but it's not. But I wanted to encourage you to um, email me if you're, in, if you're interested in it. And it will have a lot more details and uh, more recipes. And oh, that's it. OK. There so go. good job. Um, then one thing I would like to mention that I'm, I, I will have um, a website up in, in, the, in the very near future. And I will start offering consultations to homeowners. Um, I find it fascinating. People want to know what is in their yard. And you know, I found out one time when I, someone asked me to identify their weeds. And I spent over an hour just identifying their weeds in their yard. And I, then I identified all these other plants. And I decided that is what I will start offering. So I'll put the details on my website. So if you're interested in, in something like that, uh, if you're in, in the Phoenix area, then email me and let me know that as well. Well, okay. and you can, you can, great. You can even do um, virtual consults like that. I, you know, I do oh, the virtual I like garden. That. I do the virtual yeah. garden consults, and um, okay. you know, so I that's a, that. that's a yeah, that's a possibility. And I had a couple. I talked to somebody that I connected you with about yeah. Um, about doing a consult, and they were very excited about it to find out what they, you know, what they had in their yard. Yeah, I know. I thank you for um, that. That really set something off in me. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, yeah. cool. So I actually, um, I'm back on the Hammer Mill event page. Yeah. Um, yeah. And. Um, the reason I, I wanted to bring us back here, the, the mill itself, um, I just wanted to give you all a little bit more information about it. It's about a $12,000 piece of equipment. And we, they're $15,000 new. And we found one with the help of Brad Lancaster, Don Titmus, and 
uh, Jason, Janice, and I, we found one down in Southern Arizona and drove down, bought it sight unseen. Um, and although it was a hammer mill, it was pretty disgusting and I wouldn't have milled anything through it. So um, we did pay $4,000 for it. And by the time we got it up here, we had about $4,500 into it. Um, and then uh, we started looking at the attachment. So there's the mill itself, that's the red piece. And then there's the pipes above it. And what we discovered was, is they usually make those pipes out of galvanized uh, metal galvanized sheet metal and they use lead uh, solder to put the galvanized together and so when I talked to Don and Janice and Kari and uh, we it was like wow do we want to be putting lead in our flour I was like that was a great big no so we actually we did a, a, a complete refurbish and upgrade on it and spent an additional seven thousand dollars so that the Pipes up to the top right are stainless steel. So this is a true food grade mill. And uh, it's primarily for uh, milling um, mesquite beans and uh, cocoa, uh, cocoa uh, carob beans carob. that grow here. Carob that are so hard. Um, mm -hmm. And carob, carob flour, do you know anything about carob flour, Peggy? Yes. Are, are you going to offer carob milling? We can absolutely do that. In fact, there's a carob tree in our neighborhood that has beans on it that are ready to harvest. All right. Yeah. So, um, so what do you know about Another, carob beans? Well, they are like a candy bar on a tree. <laughs> Isn't that nice? <laughs> so good. Yeah. <laughs> and they do grow around the valley. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're nutritious. It's uh, kind of a chocolate substitute, and you can use it similar to mesquite. A lot of times, I'll mix the two flowers together. It's oh, yeah. gluten free. Uh, it's just great. One of the one of the things that um, Heidi does with the mesquite flower. Heidi's my sweetheart. For those of you who don't know that, um, is she uses. It, instead of sugar in her recipes, because mesquite flour yeah. can be that sweet. Yeah, mesquite and carob, both mm -hmm. of them. Yeah. Yeah, I do that too. So the reason I brought you back to this page is because we still haven't fully paid for the mill. Um, we still have a $4,600 uh, outstanding bill um, on the mill. So if you click on this page, this will take you to our fundraising page and if you know if you feel so moved, we've got multiple different opportunities for you to help sponsor the mill. Um, so if you click on this page, that'll take you over there. So and anything else before we jump into questions? Are you going to uh, offer the Eat Mesquite and More cookbook? Yep, that is one of them. In fact, if, if somebody donates, I'm sitting here looking at a stack of them. I have that two, is a two, must three, have. Eight. So everyone should should be uh, getting getting that cookbook through you because they'll save ten dollars. <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, and so yes. eat mesquite and more. That's put out by the crew down at uh, Desert Harvesters down in Tucson. It's an amazing mm -hmm. book, and I have eight copies sitting here on the shelf. So if you want to get a copy of them. Um, it comes with the $75 level um, yeah. on, on donations. Okay, enough about that. Uh, Don wants to know, is mesquite flour gluten-free? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, yes. It, it's a bean. And, and it's gl low glycemic. Is that the same as gluten-free? No, it's different. Glycemic is... I, it's an index that shows uh, carbohydrate, mm -hmm. you know, your, how it affects your body, and I think oh. it was 25%, so that's pretty low. Cool. Luis in Tempe says, what about a particular mesquite tree can cause the pods to have that bad aftertaste? Uh, Good question. 
And I did talk to someone about that, but I don't have my notes in front of me. I'm, I was going to probably put something about that in the book. I don't fully understand that, but he suggest, he gave some ideas about that. So here's 10 cents from the peanut gallery over here. I don't okay. know. I don't know what causes that particular taste. What I do know is that if that's there, you don't want to eat the bean. I tell people, right. you know, like you said, you said, pick one off the tree when it's dry, break it in half and nibble on the end. If it tastes like something you want to eat, harvest away. If it tastes, mm -hmm. if, it, if it has your face go funky, walk away. Right. And it's you. It's my experience has been it's usually the uh, non-native trees that have beans that taste like that. Right. But I have tasted some that were native, and there was a wide range. And there was one tree in that was planted at the exact same time as all the other trees, and it was awful. And it was right next to the best tree. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It's in the well, same soil. Yeah, and it can vary from year to year even. Sometimes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it can. Sarah wants to know, can you use a dehydrator? Yes, you can. That's what that's what I do. I bought a big, great big stainless steel dehydrator, and I pull all the shelves out of it, and I stuff my beans in there, and I turn it on to 135 for 15 hours, and that dries them out, and we're good to go. Thanks for reminding me. I, I got an old one at Goodwill. Now I'll use that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, Wendy wants to know, how did the Native Americans grind them up? Oh, yes. Um, well, you know, like a mortar and pestle, I I can't They're pronounce what. Matates. Matates. Matates, yes. yes. And basically it's a rock and a bowl that's made out of rock, and they just grind it together, right? Right. Yeah. Lots of, lots of time, and I mean, it's, that, that's pretty, it's amazing that they valued it that much to, Right, but yeah, sometimes they eat it like yeah. twice a day. <laughs> right? Can you imagine? Well, you know, and it's that's good though. It, it really is that good. Mm -hmm. Eva's, Eva's, Eva says to get one pound of milled flour. How many pounds of pods would you should you need? I have that written down. Um, five a five gallon bucket of pods. Usually produce, I think it's two pounds of two. Wait a minute. Well, it depends on how how, how tightly packed they're in there. True. Because I did I did a bucket a couple of years ago where I, um, you know, I sorted them all. I hand sorted them all and made sure that they were dry. I pushed them down in the bucket. I got like seven pounds of flour out of a five gallon bucket. But the beans were in there oh. pretty densely. And mm -hmm. I, I cannot say this enough. You need to make sure that you harvest the beans off of the tree only when they're dry. And the only thing that goes in your milling bucket is beans. If, we, if you bring us beans and there's rocks in there, if there's uh, beans with black marks, which is usually mold on there, we can't do them. If the beans aren't crispy when they break we can't mill them um, so make sure that you do a really good job of sorting the beans because we will tell you no we cannot sort that we cannot mill those beans if they're not clean thoughts on that peggy i i totally agree we everybody needs to be safe so we have to look out for each other. And mm -hmm. Well, and that's, you know, it's all about education on our end. So we're constantly. Uh, five, here you go. Five pounds, five pounds of beans to one pound of flour, roughly. I knew really? I had it. I just, yes. Hmm. 
we're going to, so what we're going to do this year, we're going to actually start measuring. I'll bring a scale. Okay. I'll bring a scale so we know for sure. Cause that seems five pounds of beans. Um, that seems uh, like we should get more like four pounds of flour. So we'll find out. Okay. Let's, we will let's find out. Carmen says, will you please discuss the difference in treatment of pods from the mesquite and the Palo Verde since there, she says there are more Palo Verdes growing freely. That's not, Carmen, that's not been my experience. I see mes many more mesquites than Palo Verdes, although there's lots of both of them. Yes, there are lots of both. It's, it, that's almost like a side class of its own. Um, there are pot, there's different types of Palo Verdes, and so you have your foothills that I, well, I like them both. Um, you can harvest both of them young, and when they're sweet, which they're really out of, they're a little past their prime to harvest them when they're sweet, unless you go up a little higher elevation. And so the ones that you would harvest now, well, you can harvest them now and boil them and shell them, and, but then you would have to cook the beans. You can't just eat them straight out of the pods. You have to cook them. Um, you mean or, that when, they're, when they're green, you can't eat them right out of the pods? Well, it, once they pass their prime, they're... Oh. They're, they lose their sweetness, so mm -hmm. you might want to just wait and. And can you make them. flour I, out of them? You can. You can grind up the beans in the flour, and you can make a lot of things with them. It's gluten free because it's the beans. Mm -hmm. But the difference and while there is. Go ahead. Mm. Oh, no. The difference. It's not as sweet. Oh, you're eating the bean and not the pod. Exactly. You're shelling. Yeah, yeah. So with with the mesquite beans, we mill the whole bean pod with the beans inside it. For mm -hmm. the Palo Verdes, you have to shuck the beans out of the pods, which is quite the project, I hear. You know what I think? I think I might have misspoke. It might be a five-gallon bucket to one pound of flour. I should have. That's all right. Well, come on down. Come on down to the milling, and uh, we'll be experimenting with that. This yeah. is only our. Um, this is only our second year doing a milling here. We used to bring the mill up from Tucson in 2006, seven, eight, nine, and ten, um, and then. Uh, some crazy person decided a couple of years ago we needed our own mill, so we as a community figured out how to get that done. Um, mm -hmm. uh, somebody's asking about temperature on the dehydrator. Uh, so I set my temperature on the dehydrator at 135 degrees for 15 hours. Basically what you're after is you need a bean that crisply snaps when you break it in half. There can be zero, there needs to be zero moisture in the, uh, in the bean, right, Peggy? That's right. Completely dry. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Let's see what other questions we have. Um, I might want to add that um, if the bean has some green on it, I would taste it. Um, oh, yes. You don't want anything bitter mixed in with it. So sometimes I'll find the pod that like half of it tastes good, but the other half is a little sour or mm -hmm. whatever. Or I, I wouldn't even use that. I would just, um, I mean, if you can want to chew on it yourself, you know, like just chew on the pod, but I wouldn't have it milled. Yeah. All right. Let's see. A couple more questions here, and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, how long, the cat wants to know how long the flower lasts. I, it lasts a long time in the freezer. Um, That's where I, we keep ours. I put ours in gallon jars and stick it in the freezer. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I'm sure it would last a pretty long time in the fridge, too. Kat wants to also know, what if you harvest the pods before they are totally dry, then grind them up? Wouldn't that be easier, like in a food processor? You want to speak to that? Well, first of all, you're not going to harvest too many white pods. I mean, they're going to taste sour if they're green or they have any green. Now, I sometimes find moist pods that are ripe, and I, I do set those aside. I don't – I set them aside and I eat them because they are amazingly good. <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't realize just how good a moist, ripe mesquite pod is. Um, and you only find one here and there. Uh, usually if they're moist, um, they're not quite right. So I wouldn't want flour from no. that. Well, and some of them are right, but they still have moisture in them. We actually did an experiment last year. Some friends of mine brought a half a five-gallon bucket of beans that weren't quite dry. And toward the end of the day, we decided to go ahead and mill them to see what would happen. <laughs> right. It gummed up not the mill. Good. Not bad. It wasn't really bad because it was only two pounds, but it did gum up the mill, and, you know, we had to stop and clean it out. So um, I remember. <laughs> yeah. Be very clear. Pick the beans off of the tree only. You can put a tarp down, knock it with a broom or something, and pick them up off the tarp. That's fine. You pick them when they're, uh, when they're uh, dried on the tree. Often I will find a tree that has – clusters of beans that you can actually just grab the clusters and you know if you find a, tr a good tree like good tasting tree like that within 20 or 30 minutes you can have a five gallon bucket of beans um, picked mm -hmm. off the tree if they're in clusters so that's another way of doing it um, yeah uh, let's see here what else um, I think we're if wrapping you can it find, if you can find unpruned trees like by a wash mm -hmm. and they're so much easier to to grab you might need to um, you know, take some loppers with you and cut some limbs that might be inhibiting your feet from getting close to the tree but once uh, and and also watch out for snakes <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. especially if you're around uh, low, low, you know, trees that are hanging low to the ground. Yeah. Uh, just be aware of where you're stepping, and but those are the best trees to harvest from to to get the most instead of trying to knock them out of a tree mm -hmm. that's pruned up high. Well, and we're doing two harvest events next Saturday, June twentieth. Um, social distancing mm -hmm. honored. We're going to be, at, uh, I think you and Janice are going to be out at uh, in Litchfield Park uh, near 120th Avenue in Camelback. That's a really cool right. place um, mm -hmm. for harvesting. And then uh, Dawn is going to be at um, Tempe, out in Tempe at Rio Salado, I think. So if you go to growphx.com uh, uh, and go to the events page that will talk about those events. Janice has been working tirelessly to get those events up for us. So you can actually come out and um, harvest beans, and uh, you'll hear Don out in Litchfield and Peggy out, or I'm sorry, Don out in Tempe and Peggy out in Litchfield Park talking about it next Saturday morning. Yeah, the hands-on is really helpful for people to, to know exactly yeah. what to harvest. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Um, real quick, Greg Malone. Greg's a longtime buddy of mine and a namesake. A name, isn't that what they call it? Names? I don't know. He's got the same name as I do, Greg. And um, he says, I understand yellow flowers from the Palo Verde trees are sweet and edible. Is that true? There are people who eat them. And uh, I haven't. Uh, Cactus Kelly, Kelly Athena. Oh, she's um, great. Yeah, she is an expert on Palo Verde, so if I could uh, 
recommend her very highly. And she mm-hmm. does, I think she fries them, but I haven't tried that uh, yet. Okay. Um, and Charles wants to know, uh, do you know anything about oxalates? Yes. Is is the um, flour high in oxalates? No. I have no idea what no, they it's are. Not. No, it's not. No, okay. that, that would be like in spinach and a lot of your greens and your weeds. Uh, they can be high in oxalates, but no. Cool. Hey, Miss Janice, are you still out there? Oh, yes, of course I hang around. Hey, nice. What a great class. Thank you, Peggy. Well, thank you. Yeah, you did great. You answered a lot of questions. Um, let's see, we're still, are we still on the, yeah, we're still on the Hammer Mill event. So if you click on this page, it'll take you to our uh, Grow PHX uh, collaborative uh, mesquite bean milling donation page, and you can find out about our events there. There's a calendar there. Um, Please do support us. Like I said, we're still paying about $4,800 off on the mill. And um, we need, so we need to do a little bit of fundraising this year. And that's, by the way, what, what goes, uh, the uh, money from milling goes there as well. So um, any last thoughts, Miss Peggy? Hmm. Well, don't forget to email me. <laughs> oh, yes. If you yes. want. There it is right there. Peggy yes. Sue Sorensen, the Desert Kitchen AZ at gmail.com. Because um, uh, yes. remind everybody about your consults uh, again. Yes. Well, first of all, the book will have a lot more details about mesquite and recipes. And the consults will be, uh, I guess, I will have uh, not just. Uh, now that she's given me the idea of online consults, um, I will be able to do it from my computer or your home, oh. walk around yeah. your yard, and uh, identify all of the plants that you have and let you know if they have any edible fruit or if they're medicinal. Uh, so I'll make you aware of what you have and how to use them. Cool. I, she did that at my yard. Oh, nice. <laughs> she did that at my house. She came out for my birthday party. I was like, oh, you have that, and you have that, and you have that. It was fun. Yeah, it was fun. Nice. <laughs> and I can, I can share, you, share with you, Peggy, on how I make that happen. Um, okay. Thank you. So this yeah, webinar yeah. will repeat in about 10 minutes when we reset yeah. it. And then we're going to go ahead and leave it up until 9 p.m., on um, Saturday, and because this is a, a mesquite run, we're going to make this uh, public for the um, on Grow PHX. We're going to put some links somewhere. Oh, very good. I, I've cool. got to make it happen. It's just too much information. Oh, I know, right? Yeah. I'll All, make right. It happen. All right. All well, right. I hope out. everyone uh, takes it to another level. You know, if you've never harvested before. This year will be your year. If you've harvested but never got them ground into flour, this is your year. And if you've ground them into flour but you never did anything with them, this is your year to, you know, <laughs> take it to the next level. <laughs> right, 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 right. And uh, this, uh, I just want to, because uh, I got reminded from Barbara, Rose down in Tucson. She's a long, 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 long time friend of mine. I got reminded today. She says, Greg, remind everybody that it's not just about milling the mesquite into flour. There are so many more things that you can do with it. And this uh, Eat Mesquite and More is a, I have one here in my lap now. It's a 350 page book with recipes and talking about, let's see, chiltepine and wolfberries, devil claws. Uh, prickly pears, a whole big chapter in here on prickly pears. There is so much to eat in Tall the Tall ironwood, there's, it's full. Uh, barrel yeah. cactus fruit. Oh, my gosh. I don't yeah. have it in front of me, but it, it's very valuable, and it's a must-have if you live in the desert. Amen to that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Peggy. Thank you. All right, we're going to, and I, uh, are we good, Janice?
Ah, we're good. I've got some work to do on the support page, and I'll get that worked right out. Thanks, Don, okay. for letting me know. And uh, yeah. we'll see you next week. Oh, wait a minute. you got the wait. summit coming next week. Oh, we do. On Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is our Backyard Barnyard Summit. And we're very excited about the uh, content that you're going to learn from there. So you go to BackyardBarnyardSummit.com to sign up for that. It's a free summit for the week. So we will not have class on Tuesday night. It's our regularly scheduled class. It will be the Backyard Barnyard Summit. <clears throat> so thanks for that reminder. And then next Thursday, you're going to get to see Janice's backyard. Right, Janice? I, yes, that's true, but not just mine. Oh, and Raymond. Oh, man. Show up next Thursday. The, between the two of them, they have two amazing, amazing yards. All right, farm out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Janice, for your great work. Thank you all for showing up. And as I like to say, farm out, and we will catch you on the flip side. Thanks, everybody. Uh -huh.